actually the best way to enter into a leg lock in MMA is actually taking a wrestling shot, going for a single leg, going mm. for a double leg. So you actually have to close the distance with wrestling to actually effectively pull guard most of the time. So that's, I call that the guard pulling paradox. To be good at pulling guard, you actually have to be good yeah. at wrestling. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm super thrilled to have Sonny Brown of the Sonny Brown Breakdown on my podcast today. So Sonny's a, got a ton of background in jiu-jitsu, no-gi grappling. You fought MMA a whole bunch. You've got a pretty good highlight reel. I've, I've enjoyed watching that. A background in physical and health education. And uh, I, really, you, you've contributed a lot, especially with your podcast, which is, I think, how most people outside of Australia know you. So welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Evan. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, and uh, honor to be on your show amongst uh, you know a wide variety of uh, well respected guests as well. Uh, what time is it for you in Australia? It's it's midday lunch time. Okay, so that's entirely it's civilized. It's a good lunch. It's it's very civilized. Yeah. I got no complaints. Yeah, I, I bet to connect with some of your guests, you've had to do the whole six a.m. or, or one a.m. Uh, yeah, times. yeah. One AM's been probably the earliest, and I'm I'm trying to avoid a three AM one at the moment. But we'll see how that uh, that pans out. Well, depends on how big the name is, I suppose. So, so yeah. What's you? How long have you been involved in the Australian jiu jitsu scene? It seems like, as an outsider, as somebody who's never been to Australia, and that's something I'd like to rectify. It really seems like there's a very active jiu jitsu and MMA scene in Australia. Yeah, for, for sure. So I, I think I've, I'm now 14 years, uh, 14 years training. And basically, probably the reason for that, that you know, active scene is uh, traced back to John Will, who was, mm -hmm. you know, one of the one of the dirty dozen first uh, 12 non Brazilian, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts. And of course, he you know, got a, a lot of the movement started here in Australia. So my coach, Anthony Lang, trained under John Will. And, uh, you know, it's been around, it's been around, you know, a long time. And my coach fought over in uh, Shudo in, you know, 90, I think it was 93, 94. So it's been, you know, it's been chugging along here that, that whole time and, and developing. And of course, it, it, you know, now with a lot of the competitors coming out, it certainly seems like it's, you know, getting a bit more recognition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think we got to give John Will a lot of credit. I mean, he, not only is he a pioneer, but I also really like his teaching style. It really seems that he he was went a little bit beyond. Okay, first do this, then do that, then do that. It's kind of like how, what's the most effective way to teach something, as opposed to what's the most step by step method to teach something. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he you know he, he thinks about this stuff a lot himself. Um, he's always writing. Uh, you know, putting out ideas and, and, you know, little thoughts he has online. And he definitely, you know, takes a different view to things than most people. And I always remember he was the first person I did a seminar with. And, you know, I still remember the details of that seminar to this mm. day. And, uh, you know, of course, what's, what's it's an example of a detail that you remember? Um, just X guard. So, mm. you know, X guard. You know how to, how to off balance from X guard is something that, mm -hmm. that I learned. But then also some of the stories he told, like finding a, a you know he was going on a hiking trail and he found a twenty dollar note and then he found you know another twenty dollar note I think it was, and it wasn't that you know he was lucky, but it was that he was looking, you know he was paying attention to his surroundings that he was able to find it. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know you know that that telling those stories and however he put it into into context probably did play a role in my. Uh, remembering of those techniques, but then also, you know, I, you know, I was meeting the, the the John Wheel for the first time too, so that mm -hmm. may have may have had an impact. It's a little bit of you know hero worship for the first seminar. I mean, I, I still remember things from seminars 15, 20 years ago, and as far as I'm concerned, if I come away from a seminar with one or even two details, that's a really good seminar. I, I trained with Mark Lehman back in the day, and on one seminar. I learned his sequence for applying the rear naked choke. And in another seminar, I learned what to do when you're in butterfly guard and the other guy's arm is too far away from you to grab, you know, to like lunge for it and grab it, despite the guy trying to keep it out of range. And that, that little detail, like lunging for that basing arm, 
was so fundamental that that it 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 just stuck with me, and I think about him every time I sweep somebody with that damn sweep. It is it is funny, just those little details, and I sometimes even joke about it when you know black belts come back from seminars. It is always this, uh, you know, this kind of fixation with, oh, it was the details, mate, the details. Mm. It was just, you know, it's, it's always those little details. Uh, and I think, you know, it's obviously a, a good point in that, uh, you know, you are picking up valuable information and the, the benefit of seminars is obviously, you know, you go to enough and things are going to stick and, and you're going to, you know, pick up on those on those points. But then also the flip side is sometimes it's a seminar just with a, you know, with a high level competitor. Mm. And maybe it's just, you know, I want to meet this person and, and see them too. So it's, it's, I think there's, you know, I think we've all probably been to good seminars and bad seminars. Is yeah. probably. Well, what are, uh, without naming names, uh, because we'd well, both don't want to burn all of our bridges in jiu-jitsu, although I've been doing a pretty good job in the last year uh, of burning at least half my bridges. Uh, what are bad seminars that you've been to? I mean, I, I can think of wildly inappropriate techniques for the crowd at hand. It was a bunch of white belts, maybe a white belt one stripe who knew an arm bar from the guard, and that was about it. And the guy was teaching like reverse upside down triangle choke from the guard and like fancy spider guard stuff. And these guys really couldn't, it was a, it was a reasonably small group. They, they really didn't know the, the, the shrimp escape from mount. They didn't know how to apply an arm bar from the guard with one exception. A scissor sweep would have been mind blowing to them. And now here we were doing all these super fancy stuff. And it, it really was about, I think, placating the ego of the instructor like look at me i'm so advanced as opposed to matching the message to the audience which is like hey here's what i wanted to teach but here's what you guys clearly need so i'm going to just change tack and give you what you need yeah um totally under understand that and i can do it i think pretty easily without naming names um, because I've, it's, it's something I've thought about of just like what makes a good seminar, what makes a, a bad seminar to help me decide on where I want to spend my money mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else. And like the first part for me is, uh, you know, I want to see advertise what position we're working mm. on the poster. So I know that there actually is a plan when right. we go in because the general gist of a, of a bad seminar that I've been to, uh, is basically just a lot of different techniques and moves. For here's a guard sweep. Maybe. Here's a turtle submission. Here's a takedown. Uh, here's a sweep. And, you know, if you're really lucky, two of them hook together. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's not entirely uncommon too, hmm. uh, to see that. And I've, I've been to seminars where it, maybe each one of those is a good technique that they're showing. It's great. Uh, but I've found it very difficult to actually retain that information hmm. once we leave. Uh, so I find that more, you know, it, it, it can still, you know, we can still have fun. The instructor could still give a good, you know, give a good speech, get everyone laughing. Um, but for me now, I think if there's, you know, if it's not clear what's going to be taught from the outset, I'm not as interested in going to, mm -hmm. going to see that. Uh, and the flip side of that is the best seminars I've been to is something that's just focused on one specific uh, move one specific technique and then perhaps you know showing different variations of finishing different problems you might encounter uh, different you know entries into that into that technique and then maybe by the end of two hours you still might not remember everything that was shown but the chances are that you're going to remember you know some of the base techniques that were that were shown maybe you spent two hours at least working your way towards repetition of the one technique you know, that's at least going to help you remember that. And then the other, the other thing I really like in, in seminars is when they, you know, make it clear what exactly it is that you go, you know, or clear how long you're going to be drilling and how they want mm. you to, to actually drill it. I mean, the, you know, the standard style, which is probably similar to a standard jujitsu class is, you know, show the technique and then just drill it between yourselves at a random point we'll kind of call it back in then i might show another technique might add a detail and that kind of way you know you might spend a bit of time chatting with your you know with your friend your partner or something like that 
So I prefer it if they're like, okay, two minutes, one person drill, you know, set the clock, two minutes, the other person mm. drill, set the clock, and, you, and you're aware, okay, we, we got two minutes to work, let's go. And then that's, you know, it's also an efficient use of, use of time. Do you think that preference comes from your Bachelor of Education in the sense that you understand pedagogy teaching methods and that there's, there, there is such a thing as a teaching method and that just being a world champion doesn't guarantee that you can teach anybody, that there's a difference between teacher and competitor yeah, for, uh, for sure. There is, there is a bit of, you know, a bit of a, uh, background in that teaching areas that makes me respect or, you know, maybe not even so much respect, but I'll appreciate when they've put the, you know, some time and effort and some thought into how about how they're actually going to go about teaching those techniques. Um, and I can recognize that perhaps a bit easier. Um, but it's also, you know, I think it's just from a, from a personal point of view as well, even without the, you know, the theory to recognize those things. It's also just how I kind of prefer it myself. Yeah. It's interesting how that idea of pedagogy connects through to the instructionals that are out there today. I, I remember starting jujitsu, uh, what are the 25 odd years ago, depending on what you call starting. And the instructions that were out there were almost inevitably just a grab bag of techniques. If you were really lucky, they were organized by a position. Here's a bunch of stuff you can do from mount. Here's a bunch of ways you can get up from the bottom. Here's a bunch of ways that you can sweep someone. Here's a bunch of takedowns. And the, the level of progression and the level of teaching that was in them was very low. I, it was a situation where in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And so it was better than nothing. But there was a vast area for improvement. And now I'm seeing a lot more instructions that are focused. I think the standard has become higher. They're a lot more focused on a narrower topic. There's a lot more sense that the stuff shown has to hook together. There's even sometimes the idea that you have underlying concepts which govern your jiu-jitsu or govern the attacks that you're doing from a certain position or the sweeps or the, the, the pin escapes. That what's the unifying thread of this instructional and trying to teach it at different levels. I mean, obviously in a seminar, you can go around and you can choke each individual one at a time so they can feel it. You can't do that through an instructional, but still trying to teach the same material in different ways so that you get different audience. It really does seem like the, the standard for instructionals has just gone through the roof in the last 10 years. I mean, for sure. And as it, you know, as it probably should is, mm. you know, the, the evolution of, of anything. Right. And the instructionals are getting more hyper, hyper specific. There is definitely the, the level of people putting them out is, is getting uh, higher as well. I mean, I, I refer back to, you know, the, before Danaher put his leg lock instructional out and that was, you know, it was top, it was the top secret knowledge that no one would, you know, Danaher is not going to share this stuff. Uh, but of course, once he decided to, to bite the bullet and, you know, and release it, then it really, you know, changed the game in terms of the accessibility of this information. And I mean, now you've got, you know, pretty much every high level competitor is putting their, you know, their game out there in instructional format to the point where there's so many instructionals coming out. And so much a, an absolute, uh, you know, abundance of this information that it's probably impossible to actually, you know, keep track of everything that's that's all coming out of at, out at once. It's it's pretty amazing because I don't see the same thing in other sports. I don't see, uh, I don't know, Djokovic in in tennis saying, "Here is exactly what I do to beat people. Here's how exactly how I train. Here's exactly how I cover up my weaknesses, which incidentally are this, that, and the other thing." <laughs> I, I don't see, uh, you know, uh, this in tennis. I don't see this in, I don't see coaches in football saying, here are the exact drills that we do. Now, to be fair, I'm not 100% sure that top competitors are showing their entire game. I'm not 100% sure that top coaches are showing the cutting edge stuff that their team is doing. They might be showing material from a year or two ago. That's possible. Maybe there's a little bit of, Disinform not disinformation is the wrong term, but 
selection of what parts of the system they're giving away. But but still, you just don't see it in other sports. Maybe it's just a financial thing. Maybe if competitors were making ten million dollars a year to compete, they'd be saying, "Screw you! I'm not going to make you know five grand, ten grand, fifty grand showing my secrets." But the financial model in the sport really <laughs> is to compete, make a little bit of money, get sponsorships, make a bit more money, and then do instructionals. That, that does seem to be the the model in our sport right now. I wonder if that'll ever change as the as the purses come up. I don't see high level MMA guys saying, "Here's exactly what I do. Here's exactly how I use my striking to set up my takedowns. Here's exactly how I use my takedowns to set up my striking." Here's exactly how I ground and pound. By the way, I'm competing next week you know, for the for the title, and uh, you know I sure hope my my opponent doesn't see this. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, I think it's definitely you know part partly financially motivated because yeah, as you mentioned, the purses are not generally there for the for the grapplers, and they're going to be able to make a lot more probably through instructionals than they would uh, competing perhaps. And I think also too that, yeah, for sure, they would be leaving some details off there. It would be, you know, in their interest to, you know, to have a few things left up their sleeves, but they're still putting a lot of, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of stuff out there too. Um, so there is that, you know, financial motivation to, you know, to be putting instructionals out, but I, you know, then there's also, that's the supply side, but then there's also the demand side mm-hmm. and there's got to be this demand for the instructionals as well. And perhaps, you know, there might not be that demand for instructionals for tennis or, or basketball or, or other sports. And that's where I wonder if the, you know, the martial arts model that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has come from of, you know, the single instructor having, you know, all the source of knowledge has kind of fostered that, mm. that uh, you know, that uh, a want to collect techniques and, and the, the idea that, you know, the next one is going to be the the one that contains the secret to change the game and that it's the, you know, there's kind of this, it's working on the two sides, the supply and demand that could be unique to the Brazilian jiu-jitsu setup. I think there's something weird about jiu-jitsu because you just don't, I've been part of the MMA scene and I just don't see MMA fighters going, oh my God, Anderson Silva's putting out a new instructional. If it comes their way, they may check it out, but they're really not dissecting it the way that a jiu-jitsu guy dissects a new instructional. I, I'm Golfers really, really, really want to improve their golf game. I don't know why. I think golf is stupid, but it's undeniable that they're out there spending thousands of dollars on new sets of drivers, and they're spending almost no money developing their technique to go with those new drivers. I don't see, I've, I've been in judo. I don't see judo competitors rushing to spend money the way jiu-jitsu guys do. I don't see karate. I know there's some people making you know, Jesse and camp and people like that are, are, are making a living selling karate instructions. But I think most of it is to drive awareness to their camps, to their merch. It's not really, Oh my God, I need to learn a new way of doing sanchin kata. Sanchin, you do it the way your instructor told you. you you're not interested in, okay, in Uichi Ryu, they do it this way. And in, I don't know, Waru Ryu, they do it this slightly different way. The, the, the level of nerddom is lower, I, I would argue, because it really doesn't matter whether the hand position is 10 degrees rotated one way or 12 degrees rotated the other way in Sanchin. You don't get that real-world feedback of somebody just crushing you. But it really does matter the angle that the thumb is at. when you're If you're trying to armbar me and you put my thumb at the wrong angle, I get out. And if you put it the another angle, I've got a 50% chance of getting out. And put it the other angle, I'm screwed. It's it's such a... The level of feedback is so effective, such a short feedback loop that maybe, maybe the sport is unique. I, but I think it is... I mean, have you noticed that? That there's almost nobody selling MMA instructionals and and you got to wonder why because people training MMA are just as passionate as people who do jiu-jitsu for sure and i think you know part of that is the the open ended nature of jiu-jitsu mm. as in comparison to other sports there's just so many positions that you know that mm. can be worked from uh, that are being you know invented as 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 we speak kind of uh, we could go on it 
you know, Instagram and maybe someone's come up with a new setup or a new or a new technique for, for a jujitsu uh, position. And I don't think that's happening in golf where someone's, you know, you've got someone <laughs> yeah. maybe five years into golf saying, hey, check this, check this new swing out that I've, yeah. that I've invented. I could be wrong. I'm not following any golf Instagram. No, accounts. golf, it's like, oh my God, he's putting his finger one millimeter higher. He's overlapping his little finger over his thumb, but you know, to the thumbnail instead of to the tip. Like, it's his game. I think in some ways, jujitsu could benefit from the attention to detail that golf has because it, at a certain level, it really, really does make a difference whether the hand goes here or one centimeter higher. But, uh, I, I think the improvements in golf are incremental and very tiny and super subtle. I mean, maybe they're really, maybe there's golf guys just yelling at their screens right now, in which case I apologize. I don't know what I'm talking about and, um, go back to your dumb sport. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, thinking about then MMA, uh, we should probably do, do know more about is, you know, I, I think for sure there is that financial incentive, taking a big place there mm. because if you come up with something good that no one has, you know, no one is aware of or countering and you're going to have to show it eventually, obviously in a fight. Uh, so people are going to be able to see what you're doing and it's going to be put on display, but the longer you can kind of, you know, keep that away from mm. the, from the public eye, then perhaps the, the more chance of success it has. And the, you know, kind of the way those MMA instructionals are put together is, you know, it's it's not necessarily always even targeted to people who are, you know, practicing MMA. It's more targeted to the coaches mm. sometimes, which is then a smaller, you know, uh, just a smaller market. And, the you know, the biggest part of the market that makes up MMA is people that are just more interested in watching it than actually training yeah. it as well. Um, so, you know, that, that would be, <laughs> you would see it with YouTube channels, people covering fighter tweets and stuff like that than you know than any kind of techniques in that in that regard so i think that definitely plays a role but then also you know all these sports have been around and established so long uh you know much longer than jujitsu you know other sports golf perfect example again um where you know not much perhaps innovation has happened uh with with those sports other than perhaps the technology and 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 those things around that Whereas jujitsu is really, you know, we're looking yeah. at, you know, 20, 30 years of kind of a rapid evolution. Yeah, it's been around much longer than that, but the competition every single weekend is new. I mean, when I started, there'd be like two competitions a year, maybe three if you were willing to drive for four hours. Uh, the, and the, the putting everything on YouTube was also a thing of a thing of the future. In the past, it was a thing in the future, which is to say it didn't exist yet. And uh, so the, that drove the pace of evolution hugely. Like people are going to be going, yeah, well, jiu-jitsu has been around since Helio invented leverage. Okay. Or maybe since uh, Japanese people were trying to strangle each other silly. Uh, but it, it didn't evolve. I bet it evolved more in the last... 15 years than it did in the first hundred years. Yeah, that's exactly what I was, what I was referring to, because obviously, you know, we can go back. There's the, the uh, hieroglyphs in one of the Egyptian tombs that has a <laughs> wrestling match taking place. And, you know, this, this stuff is innate in human nature. It seems. Uh, Have you seen the, the carving ground. of the centaur heel hook, like at some Greek freeze of the centaur heel hooking some non centaur. It, uh, I'm, yeah, I, I've, I've seen that one. And then there's also a uh, sculpture in, I think it's a Cambodian temple of a, you know, a double wrist lock or Kimura going mm, on, yep. uh, which is, I think, like 3,000 3, years old kind of thing. So, uh, the, you know, it's a deep history that's ingrained in, in human nature, which is, I think, an also another element of the sport that kind of puts it out into its own, own category as opposed to others. So... When you get a new instructional, Sunny, how do you watch it? Like, are, are there different ways that you approach uh, absorbing the material? Because honestly, you could sit and watch instructionals for, you know, an entire year solid, probably every waking moment. And you might not be a whole lot better. You might just be very tired and kind of fat from sitting in front of your computer. 
yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> there's there's more instructionals uh, than there are hours in the day, pretty much. So, I mean, the big thing for me now is I'm I'm taking just a lot of notes. Okay. Um, just to, I mean, even more so to uh, cut down on my time if I have to go rewatch things, mm-hmm. uh, or you know, making notes of where things are, timestamps just so I don't have to be de- scrolling through again. Sometimes if the people are talking particularly slowly, I'll even speed them up. Oh, yeah. You know? There are some instructors, not mentioning any names, where times two speed is totally appropriate. Um, and it, it actually makes it uh, pal- uh, palatable. Y- yeah, for sure. So, and I mean, then w- once I've got the ideas... Then, you know, then I'm taking it onto the mats and trialing Mm -hmm. them and, you know, working it out because generally even, you know, in any move, even if they're similar, there's always going to be some little little thing that you're going to discover when you actually, you know, try it that, oh, okay, that makes more sense to me than the way it was described. And you kind of put it into your own uh, framework and, you know, make your own discoveries about it, which I think is you know, it's an important part and crucial to actually then making any technique part of your game, uh, which is kind of what should be going on in in a class uh, situation anyway, is making those those discoveries or getting those, you know, those little moments where it kind of slots into your own your own game. I know that when I filmed a recent instruction with Rob Bernacki, the arm dragon two on one formula, a lot of it I really liked that material and it fits in very well with things that I had been working on. And I was like, as I'm editing it, I'm like, I should make notes just for my own use so that, you know, obviously I saw it as we filmed it. Some of it was familiar. A lot of it was unfamiliar. Uh, Then I saw it again as I was editing it, but that's different from training it. I was like, I'm never going to remember all this. So I should make notes. And then I was well, why don't I take this a step further and make notes for everybody? And ended up producing, a, let's say, a reference comic book. It was almost fifty; it was more than fifty pages long, and for my own use, essentially. And and I wonder if if you and I are unique in wanting to see notes, because I I got lots of good feedback on the instructional, but not too much feedback on the the notes component. So maybe I haven't asked for it, but I thought I thought that. Pro- in producing the instructional along with your set of illustrated notes would be a, a great boon to people. Certainly it would be to me, but maybe that was just me teaching the way that I would want to learn and not me teaching the way that other people learn. I, the jury's still out on that. I'm happy I did it. I've got a printed copy in my uh, home dojo that I can use, you know, that I go through to make sure I'm drilling all the, the different transitions and the different grips and the different counters to the grips. So I'm, I'm happy I did it even though it took about six days of photoshopping uh, and uh, and word bubbles in a comic layout program. But I, I wonder, making notes, I, I wonder how widespread that is and, and whether everybody benefits from it. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because it's undoubtable that taking notes is going to help with you know, memory and, re- and retention. And it's something that I recommend to, to everyone I'm coaching is like, you know, keep a training journal, you know, take some notes of, you know, of what you went over that day, try and put down any details. And, you know, what I find personally is that even just the process of making yes. the notes itself will be enough to help me remember the, the moves better. Because you're reviewing it one more time in your brain and really trying to get granular. Okay, the left hand grips his right lapel or cups his head from the I don't know, from the left side, and then you shift your weight to you know whichever way. Reviewing it after a couple hours off from not training forces it back into your brain one more time. So I, I agree that the process of making notes for myself is super useful for retaining the material. Yeah, and there's a there's a quote I can't remember who said it, but it's, it's stuck with me, which is I'm not writing this down to remember it later. I'm writing it down to rem- remember it now. Oh, and I like that. It's like yeah, it's like okay, I, I get that, um, and that's certainly helped me. Sometimes I can even just if I review something, just looking at the page kind of brings back that memory back and takes me back to when I was writing, and I can remember the day a bit better. Uh, but you can't make people 
take take the notes mm-hmm. and if they don't want to. Um, and for a lot of people, it's it's you know it's it's busy work, it's paperwork, it's extra mm. stuff that they don't necessarily want to do. Um, they might want to watch a watch an instructional and get on the mats and roll and try and uh, you know reproduce anything that they saw. Uh, or people you know turning up to class, they just want to you know have fun, have a good time, you know mm. roll, and you know things will they'll pick up things over time. And you know the the act of note taking is you know, not, not part of their, not part of their process. Would it benefit them? I'd say most, you know, most likely, I think mm-hmm. everyone could benefit from it. Maybe there's the, the exceptions where people don't need it. Uh, but I can see why people just don't do it. You know, it's extra, it's extra time. I've been at seminars where you're not allowed to take notes and that drove me absolutely insane. I made sure to, in, in a sense that it, <laughs> It forced me to really, really memorize the details. And then during every break, I'd, and I'd run off to the bathroom and write super detailed notes. And I still remember, that was the first time I learned uh, the muscle sweep, you know, from the close. This is a long time ago. I mean, close guard where the guy stands up and you underhook one of his legs and put your other hand on the ground and you arch up. I'd never seen that before. I was a high white belt, low blue belt, something. And it's because that guy that bastard said no note taking like i'm gonna remember this i'm gonna do it to spite you so <laughs> that's it's actually an interesting point something that i'm i'm thinking about at the moment is that the attachment of emotion to techniques mm. when you're showing it because i've even had a situation where where someone i was coaching mentioned that every time i showed them a technique mm. where i say you know oh, you can't do this in competition or you know this is you know a neck crank or something like that you could do it from here but don't do it in class guys he's like i always remember those ones but then i'm having you know <laughs> the other stuff uh, you know I, I struggle with i'm like okay there's got to be something there where if the, that little bit of emotion attached to it can uh, can help people remember, but I think what you also touched on there is like you know that time where there were these super secret techniques mm. that and there was only the one source that you could potentially get it from you know your instructor and then um, you know I know my coaches told stories of you know they only knew you know maybe an armbar you know rear naked choke guillotine and then that was all they had to work on for a, for a long long time. And, you know, and then someone would come back and, and show them something new. And then that was it. That's yeah. all they had to work on. And, you know, that was what was necessary at the time for, for jujitsu to evolve and, and, and be spread because that's what, what the uh, possibilities were. But I think now there's like the idea of secret techniques is, uh, you know, I'm sure someone's got stuff that they haven't shown yet. But mm. then even if anything's good and, and and works then eventually the high level competitors are going to be putting it onto you know onto videotape on on as they compete yeah. so you know eventually everything will will be out there for for people to see uh so that is kind of you know it's, it's that shift away from maybe that traditional martial arts model of you know of the secret techniques into more of a of a sport based area, which is um, you know something Preet Mikkelsen, who I've interviewed on yep. my podcast, talked about of like shifting away from uh, you know art to sport in terms of you know teaching and learning, which I think is you know it's a difficult process because of the things that we've addressed with jujitsu that seem to be unique with it. Um, but I think there's at least some shift that kind of has to take place to deal with the with the reality of the of the world at large. I know you've trained in wrestling and in uh, shoot fighting and and under different instructors. So is is there a training method that you don't see and we're not talking about techniques, we're talking about training methods, how to get good at techniques or how to get good at a certain aspect of the game that you've seen used in other sport that hasn't been used as much as it should be in jiu jitsu? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is one thing with with teaching, uh, you know, teaching styles, pedagogical styles. We might, you know, <laughs> we might say, uh, but aren't we fancy? A, <laughs> yeah, so fancy, so fancy. But yeah. there's a lot of, uh, you know, of different ways that things can be done uh, that are not utilized because primarily the, you know, there's really one or two main ways that jujitsu is taught, you know, on the on the most part, which is you know, warm up, technique demonstration, reproduction of that technique, then then uh, drilling, 
sparring, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, perhaps uh, situational sparring or, mm -hmm. you know, is, is another pretty common technique, um, which, are, which, are, which are good, you know. They, they serve a purpose and, you know, they, they can be used to teach techniques. Is it going to be the best way to teach someone a sport for 10, 11, 12, 13 years? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. I think that, you know, over that long period of time, there has to be the variation of ways things are taught. Uh, one that, one that comes up, which, uh, I discussed actually with Andy from school of grappling on my podcast mm -hmm. is the use of, of games to teach, yeah. to teach techniques, uh, which is, you know, you're putting constraints on what exactly you can do. And perhaps it's, you know, getting into an underhook from, from grip fighting, you know, and you can work with a, a class who perhaps already knows a couple of ways to get an underhook or you might show one, but then that's just you know, part of the game, getting into an underhook. And then you can, you know, add another part into it, get into an underhook and snap down, uh, get into an underhook, get a snatch single leg. So, of course, this is I'm thinking wrestling, wrestling mm -hmm. based here, um, you know, get into an underhook, get a snatch single, finish a single leg takedown. And you can add, you know, progressions onto those games. I think, and that is a, a pedagogy, um, pretty much known as as game sense, which is yeah. one developed here in Australia. And so there's a whole raft of literature on that um, that kind of just refers to, you know, using constraints and game based learning to to teach techniques. I think even the idea of giving points to drive the game, not jujitsu points for passing the guard or anything, but an example, and I think it's on YouTube is the arm drag game that Rob taught in that same instructional I was talking about earlier. Uh, I promise I'm not pimping that instructional too badly or too heavily, but it, it's a, too good an example to not show. Say I'm in your butterfly guard. If I, if you get the arm drag position and get to my side, you get a point. If I stand up, you have to pull guard. You have to like basically fall to your back and get both hooks in. If I stand up and run past your guard, I get a point. So I'm incentivized to do the right thing, to pass butterfly guard, which is most of the time to stand up and run around your guard. And you're incentivized as I stand up, as I make contact on you, as I try and get a purchase with my hands to immediately attack with the arm drag. The, the point at the, end, the, at the end of that round, you if you're doing the arm drags and I'm trying to run around you, you should have 50 points for each one or two points of mind but just that act of giving points gets that those competitive juices going and it uh it really does uh get that hair trigger going like i'm in the position go uh similar to you know i i've got the underhook okay go to the single leg just that uh, that touch memory is the is the wrong thing to say but that reflexive yeah, the jab has just landed on the guy's nose. Probably, I should be following with the cross. Yeah, so in intuition and building that, you know, intuition into into actually, you know, people's responses, which eventually everything, you know, will get its way there. Um, but those games kind of, you know, can help accelerate that process. And you know, the point point systems is great to to work that and of course uh rob Bernacki, another person i spoke to who's who's helped uh, influence me and you know the the only issue with that sometimes and sometimes with the games is people have to have the context of yes. why it's actually important 100%. um so it's you know you can explain okay if your elbow moves here it's it's bad for you that's the opponent gets two points but for people coming in to jujitsu if, if you try and put that too early, they might have no yeah. concept of why that exactly is a bad thing. And you can explain, well, that's an armbar, but they still, you know, don't know exactly why, which is another difference from more common sports is that people generally grow up watching, watching them. They mm. have an idea of how it's played. Uh, whereas that's, that's not as common in jujitsu from, at least from what I see, most people are still coming in self-defense, I mean, and self-defense is another thing that other sports might not have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, self-defense, fitness, you know, just maybe for a hobby, um, you know, uh, you know, those various different options or, or where they want to get into competition, maybe they're that, that minded. Um, and, you know, they have to kind of start from square one where. Yeah. 
No, the, the context is important. I mean, you can have all the grip fighting games you want, but if my solution to win, in air quotes, the grip fighting thing is to put both my hands behind my back and run away from you for five minutes for the, you know, or the duration of the round, you know, to jog backwards with my hand. Yes, great. You didn't get any points on me and neither of us learned anything. So uh, the, 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 I mean, uh, there are other contexts, of course. I mean, uh, you know, moves that you do in sports jiu-jitsu that you're incentivizing with some game or even incentivizing with the point structure may not be the best in, in a self-defense scenario, may not be. I mean, there's pretty good carryover between the two. I think most of this moral panic about self-defense jiu-jitsu versus sports jiu-jitsu is, is mostly unfounded. But you could see where you develop a strategy that'll work under one incentive system that'll bite you in the ass uh, in in another context. I mean, the you pull guard, I pull guard, in particular, <laughs> would be a that'd be funny to see in MMA. <laughs> but, <laughs> it would be. Um, it would definitely be. And um, actually, that's a perfect example. There was a video clip going around of uh, two jujitsu competitors this week doing the double guard pull mm -hmm. and both trying to hop back up in time mm -hmm. and, and sitting back down immediately. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of, you know, uh, behavior that can just come about and arise due to a rule set and a point system that's not actually inherently taught, but just, you know, develops because of the, of the nature of the, of the rules that are being mm -hmm. placed on them. Um, perfect example of probably what you don't want to happen in a self-defense situation, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of natural, you know, uh, uh, development of, of technique or the, is kind of what you're going for when you set the rules. Mm -hmm. And, I do think, though, that, yeah, I mean, for all the, the moral panic, as you said, I mean, for the most part, the rules uh, for IBJJF, you know, they, they're, they're still pretty good or they're the best we've got, you know, out of, a, a, mm -hmm. you know, out, of a, a, out of our selections. Well, how many MMA fights did you have? Uh, Eleven. All okay. Up. And you did uh, jiu-jitsu and wrestling before you did MMA, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started training, you know, the different different sports and you know to get it i it was because i'd seen mma so mm -hmm. you know that was in mind but yeah i've been training before and then jumped in so you never had a temptation to like do sportive jiu-jitsu in the mma context like you never immediately sat down to guard in in the cage or uh no <laughs> Look, no, hit both I, of your yeah, arms yeah. behind your back so that the guy can't go for a kimura when you're on the bottom <laughs> I didn't, but you know, who knows? Maybe that, maybe I, if I did, I could have been, uh, you know, famous trailblazing a new development. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You don't, you never know. But I, I always had the idea of training for MMA competition. Um, so for, you know, through various times when I was learning gi techniques, I remember I kind of dismissed things hmm. as, you know, cross, cross the pale choker, you know, that's not going to work. So whereas maybe if I'd been paying, you know, if I had put more importance on it, I'd, it would be better in the long run. Um, it's unsure, but even now I, I still just prefer watching MMA and, you know, and seeing that take place. Uh, I just, it's such an exciting sport, uh, mm. but I am also now watching more you know, jujitsu and, and grappling matches as well. Um, but it is, it is a good point. I wonder if they're, you know, we still have people coming into the gym who are from watching UFC, uh, watching MMA. Um, I don't know if people come into the gym and like, I've just been going, going back and watching all the ADCCs <laughs> and I really want to try this sport yeah. out. I don't know. Maybe they're out there, but I don't, I don't, I haven't heard one, heard that story yet. Yeah. Back in the day, I want to say about 10 years ago, Brandon Mullins had a good point and that's if you want to be really good in no gi and you want to be really good in MMA even, you should train with a gi. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is that you'll be training against a higher caliber of person. And I think that was certainly true 10 years ago. The very best grapplers 10 years ago were training in the gi. So it it's, was worth training in the gi just to get time in with these guys. I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really dumb analogy if there weren't very many squash players, there's tennis and squash are two different sports, but you had the opportunity to go train with, you know, the very best tennis player of the day, you probably should. 
there's enough similarity between those two sports of training with really high-level tennis players as opposed to crappy-level squash players would probably benefit your your development. I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. I think there's now so many high-level no-gi guys. I, I still think there's good reasons to train the gi, and self-defense is actually one of the biggest reasons, given that if you are grappling with some guy, you know, defending yourself against some guy in a Speedo, you know, to quote Kurt Osiander, you fucked up a long time ago. Uh, most of the time when you're fighting somebody, they're going to be wearing some kind of clothing. But if your goal is to be a really high-level no-gi grappler or a really high-level MMA grappler, I'm not 100% sure that the, the gi benefits you as much as I used to think it does. Yeah, fair point. And that's something that I you know, thought about too when I was training and was definitely the case is there was just a lot more people doing gi grappling than there were people interested in no gi uh, but i for sure that 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 has shifted now and you know at some some places i'm sure it's probably the re reverse there's definitely a lot more no gi uh, only schools popping up so that is definitely uh, you know on the rise and it's still the case where there's there's still more gi and more no gi people than there are people interested in training MMA. Mm -hmm. So you got to jump in. You got to jump in and do that. Do that somewhere. Um, so, uh, but I mean, even in terms of the equipment affecting, you know, how things are drilled, I recommend, you know, MMA fighters who are planning on doing, ju uh, you know, jujitsu classes is actually if they can, you know, grapple with the gloves that you're yes. going to be wearing in the sport. Because uh, that can make a big difference, especially at amateur when it's eight ounce gloves. Uh, so and getting used, getting used to that as well. Did you have problems finishing people with the? Uh, did you find were you one of those guys who had problems with the gloves because you hadn't trained with them? I didn't myself, but I've seen it. I've seen it happen um, to the point where, especially now with am with amateurs, where they've got to wear the eight ounce gloves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I much prefer just getting people to practice the the short choke from from rear naked chokers sometimes getting that top hand in over the over the back of their head is just n nigh impossible with these you know with the pillows on the mm -hmm. on the hand uh so it can make a big difference yeah it's it's amazing i remember guys who are fair again i don't want to mention any names but brazilians who are fairly highly ranked in mma their only training for mma would be like a month before the fight to take off the gi top and go in a t-shirt and like, okay, my friend, now we do some training without Jigi. And that was it. That was all they did. And they were high enough level grapplers at the time that that kind of sort of worked. I don't think that would kind of sort of, I mean, that might work at the, at the amateur level. As soon as you're, you know, even high amateur that that's, you're going to get destroyed. And, and so training with the gloves is an example of specificity of training. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we see it now in the in the UFC where the rate of submissions just overall has kind of dropped off, you know, dramatically. And that's not because the jiu-jitsu has gotten any worse. It's in fact because everyone's kind of level of, of training has has developed. And now uh, the, the biggest issue is actually, you know, getting people down onto the ground and holding, holding mm -hmm. them down uh, to actually apply any type of submission. The days of, you know, arm bars from close guard, having much success uh are, are long gone although they of course they they still work um but it's it's just you know dropped off dramatically and i, I sometimes sympathize with uh with eddie bravo with his you know uh with the rubber guard which i i used myself back in the day when i was fighting um because i thought it was a great you know technique to hold people down and, and stop from getting punched and you know now we kind of look at it as well rubber guard you know never really took off in mma you know so much but the fact is now we don't even really see as much close guard in mma mm -hmm. as a whole so it's like the whole the whole makeup of the sport is changed has changed you, you have a go-go plata submission don't you one go go platter, which uh, <laughs> yep, I'm happy to to you know sit on that laurel for for a while. Did you hang onto your toe the way some guys do, or was it just like put the shin across the throat and pull down on the head? It was it was shin across the throat uh -huh. and uh, and then reinforced with my with my second leg. It was funny while it was while it was going on. I uh, the Nick Diaz uh, Takanori Gomi. Mm. Go go Plata played in my mind. I remember, oh, Nick puts the leg over, <laughs> and for <laughs> some reason that, that came up. So, but uh, yeah, in the middle of the fight. So, 
in the middle of the fight. Very strange. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So like, I'm, I'm, it's, it's just the change of, of, of sport now. And like now I wouldn't even necessarily teach people, uh, you know, rubber guard unless they were already pre inclined mm -hmm. to, you know, to go down that route. They already had the flexibility They were kind of already using it. Then I'll be, I'll be happy to say, okay, here's what I know. Here's, here's how it can work. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't, it's not something that I would, you know, recommend as number one, uh, go to for, for everyone. Yeah. I think it also helps explain to some extent the rise of leg locks in MMA because you can kind of bypass the whole takedown and you can kind of bypass the whole holding the guy down. If 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 you take me down and I manage to shimmy over to the fence or even if I don't shimmy over to the fence, there are a set of techniques by which I can usually stand back up. And it's really difficult to hold somebody down if their only goal is to get back to the feet. It's possible, but man, is you know, uh, Khabib proved that you can do it at the very highest level against McGregor, but that's kind of the minority. But with uh, the leg locks, you know, you're, yeah, you can stand up. All you're doing is exposing your heel more, and uh, and and so that that might explain the the rise of leg locks in relation to you know rise of close guard submissions, say. Yeah, and that's going to be the real interesting, you know, thing to, to pay attention to in MMA if the, you know, the high level submission grapplers keep moving over and if the rate of leg locks is going to increase mm -hmm. in the sport. Uh, so, I mean, we, you know, we've got Gary Tonin, uh, you know, over in 1FC and, you know, is if that's going to give rise to, to more leg lockers in the sport, we'll, we'll wait and see. Mm -hmm. But I would and we have Ryan Hall, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, Imanari rolling his way to uh, <laughs> uh, to fame. Yeah, yeah. And the, the one thing I would I would mention I've got a I've got a breakdown on pulling guard in MMA on my YouTube channel. And after looking at them all, uh, you know, Imanari roll is one way to to get into the into the legs. But actually, the best way to enter into a leg lock in MMA is actually taking a wrestling shot going for a single leg, going mm. for a double leg. So you actually have to close the distance with wrestling to actually effectively pull guard most of the time. So that's, I called that the guard pulling paradox. To be good at pulling guard, you actually have to be good yeah. at wrestling. Paul Harris used to do that a fair bit, didn't he? Paul Harris, yeah, 100%. He would, he would get in on the double and drop down. Uh, so the idea of just, you know, the way we see guard pulling happening most commonly in sport jujitsu is not, how are we going to see it happening in MMA? It's actually going to be set up from wrestling. Mm -hmm. Did you do wrestling before you did jiu-jitsu? No, I did. Um, I started wrestling, you know, after after jiu-jitsu. Just very lucky, actually, that uh, I had a, a folk-style wrestling coach, uh, Gary Jones, who just moved over to Australia from New Jersey, happened to, you know, just live, you know, decide to move to, in close by and you know came down to the gym one day and you know we had him in there teaching some wrestling and that's you know i've been i've been working with him since uh because there's still not a very big wrestling culture in australia it's it's mm -hmm. kind of growing um but it's still you know nowhere near as big as as any of the other sports and you know any of the other combat sports it seems uh and also very lucky that folk style wrestling coach which for me just translates so so well into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, into grappling, into MMA. Why do you think it specifically, as opposed to I don't know, Greco? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Greco and freestyle, uh, you know, they're both great sports, obviously. Uh, both you know high level competitors, and pretty much every folk style wrestler from America who you know ends up transitioning into those sports as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's just the it makes so much more sense in folk style wrestling that when you get taken down you have to be able to get back up uh, you know while the other wrestlers trying to hold you down if you're incentivized to get back up and escape due to the point system mm -hmm. so the you know top wrestler can earn points from riding time uh, by holding you down for a minute and if you're if the bottom wrestler is able to get back up and, and escape they can get the escape points and it's it's there's those incentives behind it to kind of keep it 
uh, keep the action going once it hits the mat rather than just the the belly down and, and, and yeah. getting stood back up by the referee, uh, which is it just makes even self-defense as well. Yeah. It makes sense to be able to hold, actually hold someone down and actually get back up from when someone's trying to hold you down. So there's just a lot of those ground, you know, ground positions and mat work that transfer over very well into a submission grappling context. Yeah. I think judo is an amazing sport, an insanely high injury rate, but an amazing sport. And I think it has incredible athletes. But I think through the rules system, it disincentivizes a, a set of skills that would be incredibly useful in MMA and even in modern grappling, such as the ability, you know, the fighting to get back to your feet from the ground. I mean, how many judo ground... You know, it goes to the ground. I do some crazy maneuver to not land flat on my back. So essentially, how do I get out of guard as fast as possible? And how do I roll either belly down or turtle and then hold on there? Now, it's tough to attack a turtle guy. Uh, it's tough to attack a judo guy who's turtling. A lot easier to attack a judo guy who's turtling if you can get a grip and feed him punches to the head for 30 seconds. That opens up a whole lot. And, and that... that you know, the sense of, you know, fight to get back to your feet, get to back to your feet, get back to your feet, get back to your feet. That, that doesn't exist in judo. I don't mean to disparage the athletes because they're incredible athletes, but they're, they're, and I'm not saying they can't transition either. There's lots of judoka who, who've transitioned, but I think there'd be a lot more if the rule system were a little bit more congruent with, with actual fighting. Yeah. And I think that's part of the downside of, you know, taking the the sport versus art kind of transition is if as things become sports, you know that that's kind of what can what can happen to them. They can lose some of that mm -hmm. that elements that make it more like a fight, that make it you know have that creative side to to things. And uh, you know, that's the you know if we are saying that there's a bit of a transition going through jujitsu at the moment, that's possibly the thing to be cautious of in terms of in terms of sport is it could go all the way to to one extreme perhaps mm -hmm. I, as exemplified by the double guard pull yeah a hundred percent i mean you you don't you know i talked earlier about how you don't need to have context or no sorry you need to have context to understand like what could possibly be effective in a lot of in a lot of jujitsu positions. I think with that double guard pull video, you don't need to have any context of what the sport is to know <laughs> that something's a bit odd. You know? <laughs> uh, well, I, I remember taking I had Ryan Hall on my podcast ages ago, and this is right around the time that the fifty fifty guard had come into both gi and no gi competition, and people pretty much saw it as the end of jujitsu. What? I'm going to get one advantage. I'm going to put you in 50-50 and I'm going to hold you there for the next four and a half minutes. This is the end of jiu-jitsu. We've, we've discovered the unbeatable technique. And, and people were saying, you know, all the, all the old guys are like, oh my God, you know, that nobody's fighting to win anymore. Of course, this was followed in, you know, within a, a year by people figuring out, well, wait a second, there's lots of things I can do to finish the fight from here, even without heel hooks. If we're doing, a, a, if we're fighting with heel hooks, there's a million ways to, well, there's one really, really, really effective way to finish. That's an inverse or reverse heel hook. But even if I want to take the back, if you, if I have you in 50, 50, you can take my back. You can go to mount. You can pass my guard. There's, there's a thousand things we can do from there. But in that interim, I, I, I kind of put the question to uh, Ryan Hall, is this the end of jiu-jitsu? Has it lost any combat effectiveness? And he put me in my place. He said, yeah, maybe it stalls the fight, but if we're just talking self-defense, if, if you, Stefan, are trying to punch my, Ryan's face in, there's probably a pretty good plan for me to put you in 50-50 because you can no longer punch my face in. I'm like, okay, it's actually a very good... If you had to hold somebody until the cops got there, so long as they didn't have a gun or a knife or access to a, a weapon, it's probably not a bad way. Or if you're extremely ticklish, maybe they could tickle their way out of it. But And you, you throw a, a heel hook in there, and now you've got a very legit 
self-defense tool. And, and I, I take it back. If, if I ended up in a self-defense situation in 50-50, I'd be pretty happy because I know at least I can break the guy's leg if he's untrained in, in what, two seconds, three seconds. It's not going to take longer than that. Yeah, I mean, fair, fair point also uh, where, you know, my general thoughts of a lot of the idea of, of sport jiu-jitsu, you know, ruining the self-defense application, it, you know, it's probably overblown because anyone who's good at, you know, uh, competent at sport jiu-jitsu is probably going to be able to defend themselves pretty well in a, in a self-defense situation, uh, even if there's no lapel to to mm-hmm. do your worm guard in they probably have enough knowledge of <laughs> you know of all the other positions to be able to defend themselves uh the w- one area where i think that could be different is the ability to actually take someone down mm. uh which is perhaps not emphasized which it, it is a ground-based fighting art you have to be able to be competent at getting people to the ground to make it work look sometimes that's going to be easier than others but it is something that just like the double guard pull more well, like that gets, gets me worried that that's it could it yeah. could not be as competent as, as it needs to be so i completely agree with you i think that it's kind of the sacred duty of every jiu-jitsu guy to have at least a couple of takedowns we don't have to become judo black belts but if you don't know how to do a single leg you don't know how to do a double leg uh you don't know i'll throw a tomonage in there the captain kirk throw because it's basically a guard sweep and some kind of trip call it a foot sweep or no sotogari and a snap down like I, I just that's five techniques if you get pretty good at those you're basically covered you don't need to know necessarily a fireman's carry you don't need to know a belly to belly suplex i mean if you do that's fantastic but but i've been i've done a whole lot i've done a fair amount of judo and wrestling but a whole lot more jujitsu all of my serious injuries, without exception, come from takedowns. Uh, if you go to the average jiu-jitsu tournament, yeah, maybe somebody breaks an arm. I think that's the worst injury I've seen in a jiu-jitsu tournament. Although maybe uh, Dennis Hallman suplexing somebody straight onto their... Well, that's a takedown. Suplexing somebody straight onto their neck at a tournament where there was supposed to be no suplexes. That actually that's the proves my point that the takedown component of grappling is is probably 50 to 100 times more dangerous than just the grappling component of grappling. So how do you, we both agree that takedowns are super important. How do we train them so that they work and that we're not all, you know, I, I could count the number of orthopedic surgeries I've had from takedowns gone bad. It's It's all of them. Yeah, yeah, it, I, it's it definitely is one of the you know going wrong, uh, the the posting the hand out to mm-hmm. stop a takedown, and the you know <laughs> well you can see that down. scar there and this scar here, <laughs> so yes, that's that's a common one. Uh, so I think in jujitsu too, it's uh, you know it kind of goes back to when people were starting rolling on the knees. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you know probably came down to more of a situation of mat space use mm. than anything else. Uh, I think that's kind of gone away now. You know everyone's happy to work from positions. Uh, at least I personally don't see much starting on the knees. But you know then the, you you extrapolate that and the idea then of getting people everyone standing going for throws across the mat, given most people's gym space becomes becomes hard to do. Uh, so that is where drilling kind of comes into comes into play mm-hmm. and is, is, is good to use there as i was saying before there's you know the repetition and drilling is not always a bad thing uh, there is things to consider like you know safety time management mat space where repetition is going to be the best the best way to do things uh so with uh the wrestling foundation who i, who I coach for out here with with gary jones they'll they've uh put in a, a level system uh, similar to basically a basic grading system for wrestling to try and help people, you know, grow and progress through through the system. And for level one, while people are learning the takedowns, um, just learning how to fall, how to actually execute them, how to drill them, uh, you know, they're not going live and doing the live Definitely. wrestling until they're competent enough that they're not going to injure themselves. 
and then they go to level two and then then you know they can actually start going live uh from the feet then so they can start injuring the themselves then well <laughs> then they hopefully have got that level that you know that it's going to help minimize minimize those injuries but look it's it's a, it's it, every combat sport is inherently yeah, risky for sure risky as well right uh so it can start the other way is you know wrestling into the position and then working from a drill so you know yeah. so we're going to go live into the single leg and then once i get the single leg then we just drill that finish uh so there's still that means mm. of you know of live competitiveness but on the part where the injury could increase that's where we take it down a notch that's actually one of my favorite parts of your MMA highlight clip is the guy's got in on a single leg on you and you're defending. Clearly, you've spent a lot of time in the single leg position and you land something like 18 or 20. I, I, I lost count at a certain point. Yeah, a whole lot of shots hopping around, basically doing a BJ Penn imitation. You, know, you can't take me down and I'm just going to keep on punching you. I don't, I don't know how hard those punches were. But I imagine after the first ten of them, they get pretty discombobulating. Yeah, that's uh, that's again something I get, you know, just from watching other people and coming up with, you know, that uh, that to be able to pull that off, which I'm not necessarily going to show, recommend to to everyone to to do. Just <laughs> bait him with your punch. single leg, then hop around a lot. It's there. It's 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 an option. Um, so I mean, those are yeah, but those are some of the ways that you know that at least those takedowns can be can be implemented and then another way of I've actually been working on with uh with MMA is kind of just showing how the takedowns like using the same set of grips from perhaps butterfly guard and you know showing a sweep or you know against the fence um and then showing how those same grips and same principles can apply hmm. on the feet uh so you know we can start working with a you know on, on the ground and where it's safer and then work our way back up onto standing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, for me, allows, you know, a, efficient use of time by able to, you know, teaching the same thing just in a bunch of different contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something I've been playing around with a bit more. And I think that connects the techniques on the, gr I think that connects techniques on the ground to techniques standing very well. And I'd call that an intermediate to advanced skill where if we're on the ground, and you end up with a body lock pass on me and I stand up and you follow me up and then take me down where we're going from the ground to the feet, back to the ground, maybe with the same grip, maybe transitioning grips as we go. If you're not conditioned to it or mentally toughened to it and physically conditioned to it, it's absolutely exhausting. It's totally demoralizing. But if you have that ability to go, oh, we're down. Okay. And now we're up and now we're down and now we're up. Uh, I think it's a very, very powerful skill to have. And uh, I think the, the grapplers, for, forget about MMA. It's obviously super useful in MMA. But I, I think I'm beginning to see more of that in grappling, where just because you've taken me down doesn't mean I'm going to concede guard. I'm going to stand back up. And just because I stood back up doesn't mean you're going to concede whatever grip you had and reset. And so that, that linking of down to up, down to up, down to up, I think is one of the the trends that we've seen develop over the last few years. For sure, and again, that for me uh, mimics the folk style wrestling training we're doing mm -hmm. so much that it just it, that that crossover there is is huge for me. Yeah. See, I never connected that to folk style. I connected that more to MMA, but it, but you're right. It as as you pointed out, it's kind of baked into the rules <laughs> and the incentive structure of of that of that game that sport yeah yeah and so that's kind of actually it was a funny conversation the other week with one of my uh people I, that i coach which you know who was doing the the folk style wrestling and also doing jujitsu and he comes up and looks around and he he goes uh are we are we not allowed to to stand up in in no. jujitsu and i'm like no nah, man you can stand up stand up whenever you want and he's kind of you know did you just kind of think it was a um you know it was just kind of a rule or something he's like yeah look and i go yeah you know you look around not a lot of people are always trying to get back to their feet um whereas like i think realistically you know if you look around the room you should see people popping up every you know every so often yeah uh but uh you know that's just but I, this, I think this did exist in jiu-jitsu i remember I want to say 1998 or 1999, 
I asked Marcus Suarez, uh, my main jiu-jitsu coach, a question about guard retention. What do you do if the guy does this? Basically, if the guy stands up to get ready to run. And he, okay, so first you get a grip on his lapel and you basically put your knuckles into his clavicle. And you put your other hand on the ground and I'm waiting for the big reveal. Then you take your foot and you stand up and then you come back to your feet. And so at the time, that was one of those revelation moments. Like, oh, I don't have to stay on the ground. Just because I'm down here doesn't mean I have to stay here. So it, it there were currents of that in jiu-jitsu, but it, it was much less, much, 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 much less common back in the day. The fact that it was a revelation, and I was probably been training for a couple of years at that point, it shouldn't have been a revelation. It should have been, oh, okay, we're, we're going back to the feet. Yeah, and uh, part of that I think also then comes from uh, you know, the idea that getting back up to the feet is kind of the stopping of jujitsu. Mm. Like, uh, you know, the, it's anti-jujitsu, you know, uh, you know, getting it, back it to can the be. Feet the take- there's, there's nothing I hate more than two guys who can't do takedowns stiff arming each other for six minutes in a six minute match. Like I'd rather watch, you're probably both pretty good at jujitsu by the time you're purple belts. And I'd rather watch pretty good jujitsu on the ground than watch awful judo, uh, for a hundred percent uh i'm with i'm with you on that also but i you know that then just comes with competence of yeah. of being able to, sure. to work those areas I, I, I am picking a straw man like the most extreme example uh, i've seen i've seen them happen i've yeah. seen i've watched I've, I've watched those matches where it's just you know two guys locked in and pushing each other pushing each other around so so i i hear you on that for sure wasn't there a rule set where if there was no action on the feet, they'd flip a coin. And if I lost the toss, I'd end up on the bottom and you'd have to go in my clothes guard. Like if, if, if just like stalling on the ground in the UFC gets you stood back up. Yeah. Stalling on your feet or not knowing what to do on your feet should end, should bring you to the ground just from a spectator point of view. Uh, yeah. So I, I, the thing that actually comes to mind is actually Quintet Sakuraba's uh, grappling. Tool. Is that where that came uh, from? With, with, I don't think it's where it came from. Um, but it's just, it's the first thing that, I, that it's actually come to mind for me because mm. again, linking up with the folk style wrestling, I mean, Sakuraba, obviously, yeah. um, catch wrestler and the, the Quintent promotion has been very popular for him, which is, you know, he got the idea from, you know, tag, uh, tag team wrestling matches mm. to put it in there. And, you know, but it's very similar to the folk style team dual formats that they have, you know, high, high school or university versus university, um, where the two teams, you know, pair off against each other. And he, people have, uh, you know, replicated the format, but the one thing that they haven't replicated is the fast calling of, st- of stalling calls, mm. um, which is, again, something you see in wrestling a lot more, pretty much any, any style of wrestling, but they're quick to call stalling to the point where uh, Gordon Ryan was in mount in one of the matches and the referee was taking too long, stalling, and, you know, he, he, uh, he I think he stood him back up in that case, but there's also some situations where they've been reset into a referee position mm-hmm. or a, a turtle or side back position. Um, mm-hmm. So that was an interesting development that, uh, I, I've, I've found that it kind of, as soon as people try and replicate the quintet format, it's the first thing they remove. Mm. Um, but it's, look, I find the, those quintets to be very exciting to watch. I agree. Although the, it may be removing it a little bit from the uh, combative aspect of it, because if you're mounted on me for three minutes in an MMA fight, if, if you're at all competent, I'm going to be a bloodied, bruised, exhausted mess because you'll have been punching me in the head for, you know, two and a half of those three minutes. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be combatively good to like, oh, you're in mount. Okay, you should leave mount and go back to, you know, I don't know, whatever. Um, yeah, I, and I think that that is, you know, we talked about sport versus art. Mm. And then when we're moving on to quintet. Entertainment. Sport versus art versus entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then those, what are, you know. So what we need is quintet really rules cool. with the Russian five on five or the Russian 10 on 10 combat. And then a lot of terrain in those uh, 
Have you seen those uh, professional tag, parkour tag? I have. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've watched some and, oh, geez. Yeah. I, I don't go uh, out of my way to watch them. <laughs> no. no, but if we combined all of them, it, it might not be realistic, but I don't think anybody would be not entertained. It, it, none of the competitors might be alive by the end of it as well, but, uh, um, I mean, that's, that's where, it, you know, these things have to have, have to balance out. So, I mm-hmm. mean, the, you know, EBI, I think did a pretty good job, uh, Eddie Bravo, uh, even though it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you know, with the idea of overtime and I, I don't know if it was a rule, but he certainly encouraged someone to pull guard and just to get the, get the action happening, um, mm-hmm. in those tournaments. And I think that, certainly served you know served its purpose um and you know those that rule sets hey it's it's got its faults with every other rule set but it's it's still it's still pretty works pretty well um yeah. so you know there's it's, it's finding these middle grounds but the other interesting thing with the sports side is the fact that there are so many different rule sets yes. in submission grappling that you know it's a cambrian explosion of rule sets right now and it's interesting that people who are doing well in one rule set are typically also doing well in other rule sets. I don't think that'll... It, it's kind of like how Abu Dhabi used to be won just by the same guys who were winning the Mondials. Now there's specialization, and and I don't think that'll necessarily be as tightly correlated anymore. I guess if there was millions of dollars in EBI and millions of dollars in Quintet and millions of dollars in ADCC, you'd pick the one that you like the most and focus on it mostly. I mean, the, you don't see that many to go back to an earlier analogy, tennis players going into squash tournaments to, you know, make a, make a few extra bucks. No, they, they, they tend to stick with tennis. Yeah. And I mean, I think that kind of hints to the stage of development that mm. is happening in jujitsu where it is kind of, you know, there are people experimenting with new rule sets to try and take it towards that, that sport side of things. Mm-hmm. And, it's it's going to be interesting to see if those you know some of those rule sets fall away and it just kind of pairs down maybe into a into a two or, or or whatever or just maybe perhaps one, uh, and then the the next development from that could be the entertainment side or how the entertainment is is going to play into it, because of course while all this is going on, you know people have to actually be learning these techniques and are you going to specialize on one rule set? Are you going to you know are you going to work- Try and be an entertaining grappler versus a you know points based grappler. There's so many different considerations to take into account. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really interesting time to be in the sport. Uh, just before we wrap up here, Sunny, uh, two questions: If people are in Australia, how do they train with you? And if people are not in Australia, how do they keep up with you? Yeah, sure, sure thing. So if you're if you're in Australia, um, I'm teaching at uh langs martial arts and bt1 martial arts uh you can find the the info on that's on the website at, uh, for people who don't know australia north south east or west true true yeah uh it's the uh east coast sydney and okay. yeah that's uh right, so if you're going north to see the Shore, opera house sydney. make some time to train with you yeah Okay. Sydney is a big is a big place too. Uh, so it's even if if you're on the south side of Sydney, it's it takes it takes a while to get there. Um, so probably the best you know the best way for for most people is going to be um, online. Which I've got the website sunnybrown.net and the podcast, uh, which is called the Sunny Brown Breakdown. That's uh, you can just search for that on yeah. any, any podcast platform. And yeah, I've got yeah, Facebook and uh, YouTube channel as well under the name. And I'm pretty active on Instagram at the moment, which is Sunny Brown Breakdown there. Okay. Well, awesome. It's been such a pleasure to, to have you on the uh, show today, Sunny. Hey, ple- pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me on. Really appreciate it. Appreciate all the work you do. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks to those who listen. Um, well, you have a good day and I'll have a good night. <laughs> Maybe one of these days we'll meet in person. All right, let's hope so. That'd be great. Thank you.